Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, so, uh, so we're very happy to have uh, Andy Skrivich here uh, talking about costs and benefits of dynamic trading in a lemons market. Thank you so much. This is a pleasure to be here. It's my second time at Microsoft, so I'm less stressed than my first time. And it's a bit weird with those <laughs> big podiums. <laughs> I feel very important. Okay, so <laughs> this is joint work with Willie Fuchs, who is at Berkeley. My name is Andy, but so my, ma my mother feels happy I keep on using my true name. And uh, nobody knows my last name. I was actually very impressed with your rendition of it. <laughs> <laughs> so, but Andy, everybody knows me as Andy. So this is, this is a paper about, the title will be, we'll be looking at market design question, a little bit different from the typical mechanism design question. It will be kind of a combination of a, we designed the market, but then we let the competition operate on it. And the question is, will be about, uh, uh, frequency of, of trading and the main message of the paper will be dark we'll talk about the dark side of frequent trading that will be the message that frequent trading that is not always good and there's lots of reasons why frequent trading is good but this model will show you a particular reason why it may be not good and I'll start with an example and then I'll give you more motivation but let's start with some math so we you can start thinking about the model so the model starting point is the standard lemons model so for those with enough training in economics, this is called the Akerlof's model, the trading for lemons. This is a model of adverse selection. So here's how the model goes. There's a seller that has one unit of an asset and the competitive market of buyers. The seller has this asset and when he holds himself the asset, it will yield him a payoff flow of C. And it's on this graph, there's the C and there are different types of buyers, so sellers, some have have low value of holding the asset, some of them have high value of holding this asset. Or to put it differently, some of them have good assets, some of them have bad assets. Importantly, so in this example, I'll make C to be distributed uniformly 0, 1. Once we go to the general model, I want to have some more general distributions. But for now, this is uniformly distributed 0, 1. And it is known by people that the seller needs to sell this object, that he's not the efficient guy to be holding the asset, that the buyers would be more efficient to be holding this asset, and the value to potential buyers is V of C, and it's the same for all the buyers. And the key is that the C is private information, so what would be efficient, the efficient thing would be that everybody trades, because for all types, V is bigger than C, so their gains from trade equal to the size, the area of this triangle. The problem, Akerlof points out, is that this market will not be efficient, because for this to happen is the price would have to be one, because the type one is not going to sell unless he gets a one. But if the price is one, the buyers would be losing money because on average the value is only three quarters. So there cannot be exist an efficient equilibrium, so that's the, that's the idea of Akerlof for which he gets a Nobel Prize. I didn't understand that last point. So, yeah. so efficient trade would be that everybody trades because yeah. for everybody value is more than cost. Okay. The seller's highest type is one in this example. Yeah. So he says, I'm not going to sell until, uh, unless I get the price of one. So the only candidate for competitive equilibrium would be a price of one. Oh. Or at least that's the smallest price you can, oh, you can have that all the types. But the problem exactly is that the, the price of one, the buyers on average, every, all the types trade, they get a price of one, but the buyers are getting only a value of, of three quarters in this example, because I made this example that V of C is one plus C over two. Is there one good or? There's just one unit. You can always take these models to ta change them into, the, rather than having one seller in the distribution, you can have it that there is, there's a continuum of people, okay. each of them a unit, and they are drawn from this distribution. Those models are always one-to-one. -one. Okay? Good. And then the only new thing I'll introduce to this model for now is I, I, ca I can allow that this prime information is short-lived, that if we don't trade until cup T, then the type becomes public, and then everybody trades then the market is efficient, okay? And there will be a common discount rate R for, to do, for that if we delay trade, we lose some payoffs at the, at the rate R, okay? Good, so that's, that's the Akerlof model. And 
in the Ackerman model, what's an equilibrium? An equilibrium is a pair price and a cutoff such that this is the equilibrium price. That's the cutoff all types below this cutoff trade. And they had to satisfy two conditions. The first condition is the zero profit condition that buyers compete away the profits, that the price is equal to the expected value condition on the, all the guys who are trading. And an indifference condition that the guy at the cutoff is indifferent between trading or not. When cap T is infinity, so little delta is the discount that, that comes from waiting until cap T. If cap T is infinity, little delta is zero, then the condition is the cutoff guy gets a price equal to the value of, of holding this asset, so K zero. When we have this cap T being finite, there's another consideration. If, if, you do, if you say I'm not trading, then at cap T you will trade, and at cap T you will get a value corresponding to your true type because type becomes public. So that's the indifferent condition. These are two equations to unknowns. In the uniform case, they have unique solution. Turns out you can solve them. You get these two nice numbers, K0 less than 1, P0 less than 1. And with this, then we uh, will start asking a question, what, how efficient is this market? And the market efficiency I'll define as the integral. First, between the, the, first I'll have the types that trade at time 0. And this is against from trade V of C minus C. And it's uniform distribution, so it's just, just this integral. Plus, at capital delta, I, I imply the discounting, and everybody else trades. And all this slide is trying to do, this is the definition of gains from trade. And it, it's computable in this example. Yes? Uh, this is the gains? These are the gains from trade. If we didn't have the market, uh, the guy would always be holding the assets. So we always be having C. This is, this is not necessarily, it will be turn out to be also the average payoff of the seller because the buyers make zero profit. So whether I'm talking about gains from trade versus profits ex ante of the seller is the same thing. Perfect. Good. Can you go back one slide to the, so this, this got, so that last equation there, so if I think about waiting until time t when the value is revealed, at that point I'm expecting to make zero payoffs because... No, no, the seller gets V of C. And the buyer, the buyer is expected to make zero payoffs. Yeah, buyers make zero payoffs okay. at cap T. Okay. So yeah. So the, the first constraint is just the utility, the buyer's constraint. Right? Yeah, that the buyers don't the make zero profit. Yeah, exactly. And the second constraint is the cutoff guy K0 is indifferent between trading and not. This is the seller constraint. That's the seller constraint. So the seller has to be indifferent. If he sells today, he gets a payoff of P0. Why isn't it a function of, of uh, C? So the C is the, is the K. Oh, oh, so okay. C is the t type, K0 is just the cutoff. Right? So if you trade immediately, that's not a function of, of C. You just get the price. If you wait, it's totally a function of C because for this amount of time, discounted time, you have to be holding the asset. And then at cap T, you get the price which depends on your true type. Oh, I see. So T is a random variable. So, so if I think if C is random, then... C is point. random. Cap T is known. Okay. Okay. Good. Now, let's look at a different way of, des of designing the market. Rather than trading either at time zero or cap T, I allow that you can trade any, at any moment between zero and, and... Actually, that should be cap T, not one. Any time between zero and cap T. Now you say, well, so first of all, this equilibrium which we just constructed, that's not going to survive. Because after the first second, we know already all these guys, let's go take delta to be zero. So all the guys below two thirds already traded, that the value is at least V of two thirds. So the price would jump up discontinuously, but then everybody would wait for the price increase. So it turns out the equilibrium is actually described by these two continuous time processes for the price and for the cutoff, which satisfy the following two equations. The first one is the zero profit condition on the buyers that given the current cutoff, so the in equilibrium there will be smooth trading through the demand curve, will be going up through the types. At any moment of time, price will be equal to the value of the guys that are currently trading. And then there will be differential equation, which is the indifference condition of the current cutoff guy. He can trade immediately and get the gains from trade PT minus KT, but you can also delay. By delaying, he loses this much interest but then the price goes up at that rate. And these two things have to exactly go at the same rate to make it work. And the nice thing is you plug in for PT, V of KT here, that's just an equation of one. And for this PT, also this V, 
Let's just make one differential equation with kt. There's a boundary condition k of 0 is equal to 0. It has a, it's very easy to solve in our ex linear example. That's the solution. That's how the cutoff will be changing over time. R is the instantaneous discount rate. Right? So R time e to the minus R cap t, that's, that's the little delta. OK, so now what's the, serp what's the gains from trade? Now I integrate between 0 and cap t. Now I multiply things by discount. That's the gains from trade. And then what's the, what's the flow of trade? That's kt dot times little f of, of, of k. But little f, that I, I have uniform distribution, so that's just 1. So that's the speed at which through I go through types. That's per type gains. I integrate it over time, discounting. And then whoever doesn't trade by cap t, then I just multiply by the discount. Everybody trades at cap t. And again, this is computable. You get the number. And the interesting question in the paper we're going to ask is, which of those two numbers is bigger? Which of those market designs, one in which people are very restricted to trade? You, can, you have one trading opportunity. When Microsoft comes to Yahoo and makes an offer, 35 bucks per share, they are telling them, if you reject this, we'll not come back with another offer in the next month. We, if you reject this, we will do something else, and we will not come back at least for a year until, <laughs> until you're worthless. <laughs> By the way, I'm Yahoo employee, so, <laughs> but only till the end of this month. <laughs> Don't tell them that. <laughs> so the question will be, we computed, this was one market design in which you could only trade at zero or cup T. Yeah. And we computed the gains from trade. Now I computed a second the market design, which this should be cup T. You can trade any time continuously. The equilibrium is different. And hence, the gains from trade will be different. And the question is which, which are bigger. And let me show you the graph. So, so even yes. In the second case, there is a cap T. <coughs> there is a cap T. Yes. Where did it figure in the solution? So it doesn't figure. So that's a very good point. So a few things about the solution. First of all, it turns out the solution will be independent of the distribution. So let me show, tell you why this is independent of distribution. Even if I put general distributions, the zero profit condition, that's independent of the distribution because there's no atoms of trade. And the indifference condition is also independent of the distribution because the current cutoff guy knows who he is. So that's one thing. This will be independent of the distribution. That's why it's nice to work with these continuous time models. Another thing is that the cap T, the cap T doesn't show up in equilibrium. It only shows up at which point you stop trading. So you go smoother through this path, and as cap T changes, either you go through a lot of types before cap T hits or not. And in this equation, it shows up here. So there's cap, you integrate up to cap T, and then here is K cap T, where you just plug it in. So that's the total gains from trade in this continuously trading market. You integrate the gains from trade for each type, multiply it by, by the time when he trades. Good. So there are some people who trade before cup T. Oh. That's continuous. And then there's some people, there's a whole atom of people who trade at cup T, which is the second part. So that's the, that's the graph. Let me first tell you what I'm graphing. So I also computed what's the surplus in the first best, if I, if I could do efficient trade, which is the whole area of the triangle that I was showing you before. And I subtract from this the surplus in the, this restricted trading. So this is, this is the efficiency loss due to adverse selection in the Akerlof model. And then I divide it by the efficiency loss of the, of the adverse selection in the continuous time trading model. And then I graphed it for different deltas. So cap T being 0, that's 1. Cap T being infinity, that's 0. That, the fact that this is 1, that's not surprising. When cap T get, converges towards 0, the, there's no adverse selection because almost immediately we'll, trade, we'll reveal the time. What's interesting is that this number is always less than 1. And actually, when cap T goes to infinity, that converges to 1 third, which means continuous time trading generates three times as much deadweight loss as restricted trading. And that's the dark side of liquidity in this paper, the dark side of, 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 restrict, of continuous time trading. So that's, that's kind of where we start. And now the question is, how general is this? Maybe it's only holds in this example. 
And also, well, there's only two possible designs. You, once I have these two omegas, these are kind of the two extreme. All, everything is in the omega and on, only zero and cap t is in omega. How about other designs? So and that's what the question of the paper is. Can we ask about the market design from the point of view of designing timing? Okay. So what are going to be the trade-offs? The, the trade-off is with the restricted trading, I get a lot of people trading at the beginning and not suffering any discounting. With the continuous time trading, the low types, I get less surplus from them. Because for the low types, they trade in both cases, but in the continuous time trading, they, tra tra they trade late. They, in they incur uh, discounting losses. But if cap T is long enough, then if I go to this, let's make cap T infinity, then only people up to two thirds will be trading in the restricted trading. But with the continuous time trading, eventually everybody trades. That converges towards one. So if you look at the, the composition of the gains from trade, the restricted trading market has higher gains from trade for the, all the guys below two thirds, but smaller gains from trade for high types. And in fact, it turns out that I can create, find distributions, even with the same shape of the V of C function, I can construct distributions for which the continuous time trading will be better. And one example of distribution would be, let's put a lot of mass close to zero and a lot of mass close to 0.9. And then that will make the, the, the loss from delaying for the guys close to zero is very tiny, but then there is a big chunk still to be gotten in the dynamic trading in the other case. So what's important about this is the following. Once you see the first result, you may think, well, I remember spent signaling model that, that, that the good guys go to school, school is useless, but it's just painful. So, but the good guys still go to school because they want to signal their good types. In terms of ex-ante efficiency, this is bad because that doesn't improve anybody's productivity. We just waste time in school, okay? <laughs> that's Spence Nobel Prize, <laughs> right? So, so in that model, if we could stop people from signaling, that improves the ex-ante efficiency. Here, delay, people also use delay to signal that there are good types. I'm delaying my trade, I, I'm, I, I have an IPO, I, sorry, I have a startup, and I'm thinking, somebody's coming to me and saying, well, why don't you sell, sell me your startup? I said, no, no, I'm pretty sure I'm a good type, I'm happy to continue, and by the, keep it, keep running the company l longer, either I get to cap T that I prove to you that I have, I have good revenues, or just by delaying, by willing to, to run the company longer and showing you that I'm not running out of money, that means I'm not doing that badly, I convince you that I'm a better company. So. In this continuous time process, what's known about the prior? So if I'm a buyer, uh, am I just buying as soon as I'm happy with the trade, or do I know something about the distribution? Over you the need to know the F. No, you don't. OK, so good. Very good point. So remember when I claimed here this whole equilibrium is independent of the distribution? So the prices follow this pattern, you don't even need to know the distribution. But it's a little bit lying. Let me tell you where I'm lying. I have normalized in this example that the distribution is, the support of the distribution is between 0 and 1. That's going to only work, you need to, you need to know the support. You don't need to know fine details. In the continuous time training, you don't need to know the fine details of the distribution. You need to know the support. You need to know where the process starts. As a buyer, you need to know where the... And, and am I acting up? Like, if I knew the distribution for C, and I know your strategy, is this buying scheme optimal for me? And it's independent of that. Yes, so that's a very good question. So the way I'm going to write this model would not be actually game theoretic. But you could turn this into a game theoretic question, game in which you come as a buyer, you can quote prices. Yes. And the answer will be, it will depend whether prices, price offers are public or private. So this, for this model, assume that when you make a price offer, it has to be public. And then the answer is, this is going, the continuous time trading, if I write the game in discrete time with short periods, and then I make length of the periods go to zero, in this example of uniform distribution and and this linear function, this will have unique equilibrium. And as I take the continuous time limit of that equilibrium, it will converge to what I showed you. So there, everybody's 
maximizing that's going to be right. Direct, if you, you can see this also directly in continuous time. I'm telling you that the price, so this is the cutoff at time t, and the price at time t has to be v of this. Now, if you deviate to a lower price, the seller is just going to reject you, so that's not useless. If you deviate to a higher price, then everybody sees that you deviated to a higher price, and then from that moment on, we, the market will continue from, not from the old price, from the, the price you started, as if you just jumped over time. But then you're going to lose money. So that's why that is, I have not defined the game in continuous time, but if you were, this would be a well-defined object. Yes? So is there some optimal distribution of trading time? That, that will be one of the questions, perfect. I'll try to answer that question. So, so these will be the questions you could ask. So let me finish this, but this will be one of the questions. So, so what my point about this, this could go either way. This is not simply that restricting trade is stopping people from doing costless signaling, and costless signaling is bad for ex ante efficiency. It's more subtle than that. Okay, good. So the general problem, first of all, let me tell you a few examples. So where do we these, see this question? So one example is when people do an IPO, there's often a lockup period that after you sell some shares, you cannot sell additional shares for some amount of time. And the question is, why do people have those kinds of provisions? And my answer would be that, as, as this paper will, the paper is not a model of IPO markets because there's multiple units there and I have one unit. But the, my intuition is that without those provisions, the adverse selection problem would go worse. That, that the buyers would be worried that the seller will use the fact that they went for IPO to get the better price. And, and, uh, and hence the good types would not be selling them as much. There's another interesting set of questions in recently driven mostly by recent events is how to organize financial markets. So, so in the last 10 years, we see uh, these dark pools. So let me tell you what dark pools are. So this, the stock exchange is running basically <laughs> continuous time trade. These days, this is nanosecond trading. And in response to this, people started creating dark pools, which are institutions that only selected, by selected traders are invited. These are typically institutional traders. And these guys come together and say, we'll trade only four times a day. And we'll come together, we'll submit bid and ask, well, we'll submit demand and supply functions. They actually don't, don't provide prices. They just say, I want to sell that many units, I want to buy that many units. And then they use the continuous time market price to clear to decide at what price they trade, and then to make sure people don't try to game the system, they don't even tell you which price exactly they will use. They say, there will be a plus minus 10 seconds window from which we'll use a price, and we'll choose a random price at that time. What's important about these dark pools is one, they, they, they clear only a few times a day, so the idea is that they try to aggregate trade, and two, they, have, they are non-transparent. They don't reveal, the reason they're called dark pools, that the order books are not revealed while in the typical exchange, the, all, the, all the book is open. And then also in some stock exchanges, there are periodic auctions. So I've, after I started presenting this paper, somebody told me that the stock exchange in Japan runs an auction at the beginning of the day and at the end of the day. In these cases, what is the right that is becoming public after a little while? So then you can think up to infinity. I, we also have an extension to a case where the type becomes public at the Poisson rate, at the random time. But in the first case, for instance, the type would be the value of the IPO or something? The exactly, value. exactly. That would be, so that would be the value of the IPO. Yeah. Or like the underlying company. Good. And then, and then I think there's other examples of, for example, in stock, in stock exchanges, you see often that the volume of trade drops before announcements, and sometimes actually the stock exchange suspends the trade of given assets before if there is expectation of, of a major announcement coming. And then finally, I think there is situations like my story about Microsoft and, and Yahoo of, of potential buyers building reputation that if you reject my offer, I'm not going to come back again in the next week or in the next month and that's going to help with adverse selection. And then this model is going to be also, I think, useful to thinking in the recent, to, about government interventions. 
And in the, and if we have time, I'll show you a little bit. But there's this question in the model with, with, with asymmetric information, like with those tox toxic assets, one story people had, why there was a drop in, in volume of trade, because people were worried about adverse selection. There was increasing the uncertainty about the value of the goods, and that lead, led to more adverse selection, that led to less trade. And uh, you, can, you can this kind of dynamic trading market to say something, what could the government do in that kind of world? Let me drop the related literature. Uh, so the general model is C will be distributed over some bounded interval normalized to be 0, 1 according to some general distribution F of C, which will be po strictly positive everywhere in differentiable. Uh, then the value to the buyer is some general function, which is strictly increasing and twice differentiable. And then I'll make the following two assumptions. First, V of C is always bigger than C for all C's other than the highest C where they're actually equal. And that gives me two things. First of all, there will be gains from trade even at the bottom. Right? That will, will help me for the dynamic model that will actually have some trade. What that helps me with is that I don't have to deal about out, with out of equilibrium beliefs. If there is a gap of values on the top, there exists may exist equilibria in which after some amount of time everybody is supposed to trade all types of probability one but then the question is what should be the beliefs if the trade hasn't happened and in economics we always have these problems when there's out of equilibrium beliefs because that creates a lot of freedom and there's multiple equilibria by making this assumption I make sure that the highest type never trades and hence I don't have to worry about out of equilibrium beliefs good so the general problem now will be I will try to compare different ways of organizing the market, di comparing different omegas. These two omegas I already showed you. And here are some other examples. One which we call early closure. We trade at time zero, then we close the market for some amount of time, and then we reopen it and it's open continuously. And then the other market design which we call a late closure, it's open continuously until some moment, and then some amount of time delta before the realization of the information, we close the market. Okay. And you can imagine lots of other setups. So what will be an equilibrium? Given the market design omega, a competitive equilibrium will be a sequence of prices and cutoffs, which are measurable with respect to the omega, such that, that satisfies the following conditions. There is zero profit condition. Given the range of types that trade in a given period, price is equal to the expe conditional expectation of the value. Seller optimality. Given the sequence of prices, the seller chooses optimally at which period to trade. And then finally, there will be this one more assumption. There will be some minimal competition that at price at time t, if we, I arrive at the period with the cut of kt minus, so it's not that kt will be the cut of at the end of the period, but kt minus is the cut of at the beginning of the period. The price cannot be less than what we know it's the smallest value available on the market. And you need this assumption to get rid of some stupid equilibria, like the price is always zero. Because the price is always zero, nobody trades. Because nobody trades, there's zero profit condition. So that's what, what it gets rid of. And other people have suggested in introducing this before. So it will be an equilibria. These are the two extremes. Here's an equilibrium. I already described it for, for, the, ex for the restricted trade. And we have, you can prove that it always exists. This actually goes back to Akerlof. And then turns out that if this condition holds with this, this animal is strictly decreasing. So that's like a hazard rate important condition. The hazard rate is, is going down sufficiently fast, but then the equilibrium actually is unique. So that's not that big a deal. This continuously open trade market that's actually always has unique equilibrium, which is what, we, what I showed you. We slowly go through the types. And there's the differential equation for the indifference of the current type. So what can we say in general? So the first case will be when cap T is small. It's a short-lived private information. <coughs> and the general result is the following. Give me an V, give me any distribution. I can find short enough horizon that the restricted trading will yield more gains from trade or more profit to the seller ex ante. Uh, than the continuous time trading. So it's not doing that, it's comparing all possible omegas, just these two omegas. And the way the proof will go is the following. Remember I told you the trade-off between those two things are 
There's less discounting in the restricted trade, but possibly more people will trade in the continuous time trading. If I can show you that for small cap T, less people, fewer people trade, fewer types trade in the continuous time trading, then I know for sure which direction the surplus goes. Because the, the discounting always helps the restricted trading. So there's actually fewer people trading by cap T in the continuous time trading than I'm done. And that's how the proof works. That's the differential equation so that says how the types change over time in the continuous time trading. As a first order approximation, this thing is zero. That's just V prime of zero. So you can say what's KT, that's K, K at cap T. It's approximately as a first order is R times cap T times V of zero over V prime of zero. So that's just first order Taylor expansion on this. Now, how about how many people trade as a function of cap T in the restricted trading? That's the equilibrium condition. That the price, which is the expectation over the conditional expectation, condition of the guy is below the cutoff, has to be equal to the payoff of the guy, cutoff guy if he keeps the good. When cap T is small, then K0 is small. When K0 is small, because we have strictly positive density everywhere, this thing is approximately the same thing as I had uniform distribution. So most importantly, the derivative of this at K0 at, sorry, at, yeah, at respect to K0 at K0 equal to 0 will be the same thing as if I had uniform distribution. A uniform distribution, that's just the average of the extremes. Values. And then the right-hand side, you can also approximate. And it's hard to go through the algebra on, on the fly. But what's important is I, I get an expression which looks exactly like this expression, just with the number times 2. And the time 2, two comes, I don't have a, an intuition that I can explain my mother, so I apologize. The intuition comes somehow, if I make cap T a bit longer, that makes the cost of delay higher for this guy. So that's bigger cost of saying no to the price today that's good for adverse selection because it's the guy is, is more willing to trade. But, but that's the only thing that's happening in the continuous time trading. That if you, by delaying, if I make the cost of delaying a little bit higher, the, guy, the, guy's, the speed at which we will trade will just go up by that much. The nice thing is that with the restricted trading, there's another effect on this side. That if, if I get the adverse selection to be less severe, the price goes up. Because at that moment of time, there's a lot of people trading, and the price goes up at kind of half the speed as the number, as, as the cutoff of types. And because of that, there's an extra gain in the restricted case from, from having, from having lo, lo, bigger cost of delay, and it's actually twice as big because, because, of, because that's going to half the speed. Good. Sorry, so just one more yes. sentence on this. So the price goes up half as fast, and that's, we, we like that better than, it was going, than if it was going just as fast. It was not going at all any faster. So in the continuous time trading, the price is just equal to the current cutoff. Okay. So that, that term is the first order term is zero by how much the price improves. I see. And here they improve by, by strictly positive amount. Okay, so now let's go to your question. What if I have a general cap T? And then what if I have general omegas? So here's the, the proposition. Suppose the following, let me first walk through this. That's the hazard rate multiplied by the, by the gains from trade. If this thing is decreasing, and then it turns out and when, when capital T is less than infinity, I need to also have that this thing which has deltas in it is also decreasing. But it's also that this first term is the same, but there is an extra term here with V prime in it. But if those two things are decreasing, then out of all possible omegas, this omega is the best. Okay? And let me tell you kind of how we prove this. This is like decreasing hazard rate, basically. Yeah, but the, the first condition. This condition? Yeah. So this is the hazard rate, but then there's additional thing that comes whether, whether, whether V of C, C is convex or concave. And it's hard for me to immediately know. This is the first time I see it, that condition. Like this one I expected. This one I expected because when I do mechanism design, this looks like marginal cost. It mechanism design. So 
I know that I will not want to do ironing when I have certain monotonicity condition on the hazard rate. So that's the condition. And unfortunately, this cap T cre creates that there's additional reason, and I'll explain why. Why there's a natural, not a condition, but a, I don't know why that, that particular thing. Yes? I, I think in, uh, in risk averse uh, mechanism design, I think something like the first thing might show up. But the funny thing is I can make True, so if, uh, you're saying a V of C, but the guy is, why is the guy, I, I agree that something would show up, but I don't see why this is, sh is showing up here. So it's true, a V of C is, a V of C is linear, then this is just a constant. So, so that this, the V of C is linear, this thing disappears, so it's just one condition. So somehow it is about curvature of V of C, but the seller knows his C, but maybe it's because of the buyers. Yeah, it may be because buyers care about the curvature of, of V of C, yes. Go ahead. So if T is infinity, do you still need both of them? No, no. So when cap T is infinity, then delta is zero, then this thing disappears. Oh, yeah. Good. Then this thing, this thing is, and this is the same thing. And then your best design is just at zero. Design. Just only trade at zero and never again. Okay. Which is kind of, I was guessing that I should get something like that because in a standard monopoly problem, if you tell the monopolist, you can trade at any time you want to. So you're facing a demand curve, and you can choose the sequence of prices and commit to it. But then there is a condition which looks like this. It's a little bit, there's none of this, because this is a constant there. But there's a condition about the marginal revenue curve. If the marginal revenue curve is, con is monotone, then the optimal thing to do is to have a constant cutoff over time. So, so you divide people, either you trade immediately or never again. Which is the same thing in Meyerson optimal auctions. The optimal mechanism is you give to people either probability one or probability zero of trading. You never do something in between. And discounting is like prob assigning probabilities. Because in the profit, in the expected, expected payoff, whether you multiply something by discounting or multiply something as by probability less than one, mathematically is the same object, right? So this is why I expected something like that to happen. This new term happens because of something more complicated. So so let me tell you how the proof works. The way we write the proof, we say, let's forget about these equilibria for a moment. Let's look at the mechanism design problem. So now what is a mechanism? A mechanism now, it will be a direct revelation mechanism. The seller comes to the mechanism designer and reveals his type. And then the mechanism designer has the following three levers. One is the probability of trade before cap T as a function of the reported type. If you tell me your, cap, your type, I'm telling you what's the probability you'll trade before cap T. Then the second thing is conditional on you trading before cap T, I'm going to have a distribution over the times where you're going to trade. And because the seller is risk neutral, you, instead of thinking about the whole distribution, a sufficient statistic is the expected discounted time at which you trade. That's a standard trick that you can always change discounting into probabilities, which is, which is this. And then finally, is the expected transfer is conditional on trading before cap T. Typically, when I do mechanism design with, over time, only these two things show up. And here's this new element that shows up is this thing, probability of trading before cap T. And the reason for that is, in the standard mechanism design, we never have any exogenous information coming. But here, if we delay till cap T, we have exogenous information coming, which is the true type. And then at that point, the transfers and allocations, I'm already tied at my hands because it has to replicate an equilibrium. It has to correspond that at cap T, people get their true value. So this is why this cap T creates additional things. If cap T was infinity, that's much more standard mechanism design and I would have just a standard condition. This cap T, that at cap T truth comes out, makes things worse. Now if I really wanted to do more general mechanism design, I could do also that if at cap T information comes and turns out that you didn't tell me the truth, I kill you. And then I can probably solve all adverse selection problems. Because with like epsilon probability, I'll wait cup T and then I'll kill you. If you didn't tell the truth, so then everybody will tell the truth so I can get efficient trade. So I'm tying my hand saying, if I don't trade at cup T, the payoffs are already the pinned down by the equilibrium at cup T. Okay? And now uh, across all these mechanisms, I'm do, I will do the following. I'll try to maximize the ex-ante profits of the seller, as you pointed out, gains from trade or profits of the seller is the same thing. 
Subject to the mechanism design not losing money on average. This is not necessarily going to be the same thing as having competitive equilibrium because competitive equilibrium requires zero profits period by period. I'm allowing potentially here to cross subsidize between periods. Okay. And once you have this, I'm not going to bore you with how the proof exactly works, but the, the trick is the following. You take the envelope theorem fo formula for, for, for the problem of reporting truthfully your type. That, you, that allows you to write down the, pay, the derivative of the payoff of the seller as a function of only the allocation rules, only of these two things, and not of the transfer. Once you have the payoff of the seller, you can then say, okay, now I integrated over all types. That tells me now not the derivative, but the level of payoffs of each type, and then I take expectation over this. So the objective function, and now I can write only as a function of the allocation rule. Then you take the constraint, which is saying that the, that the mechanism design doesn't lose money on average. You can also replace, you can replace the transfer rule by saying that the total surplus minus the payoff of the seller. Again, you can write it down just as allocation rules. And I have, you have this big expression, which is the objective function, and another big expression, which is the, the constraint. But then, if you remember Myers and Satterwhite in the second part of the paper, they say, well, once we know you cannot do efficient trade bargaining in Myers and Satterwhite, they say, what's the second best? And they say, let me maximize surplus subject to not losing money on average. And they say, under these monotonistic conditions, you can do it simply bang for the buck. You can take the derivative of the of the objective function divided by the derivative of the uh, constraint, rank those, and if it turns out that that gives you monotone allocation, you have found the optimum. And it turns out these are the two monotonicity conditions I need for these ratios to be monotone in type, and then that means that the bank for the buck formula implies that you'll find the cutoff, and guys below the cutoff, you'll try to push as high probability as possible, and guys above the cutoff you'll try to push it as small as possible. So that gives you this restrict that the best mechanism in this family, and then you, obviously you see that the particular equilibrium implements the same allocation, and hence it has to be the optimal. So that's the mechanism design question, so that's what we've done. So this was the case when at the end you were getting trading at either zero and t, right? Or was this no, so that's the, the result. Out of all possible omegas, the optimal, if these things are monotone, this, that's the optimal across all possible omegas. And in the proof of, so, so this particular mechanism, I suspect you're, you're not, the, the seller is not on average zero, but always. Exactly, it's always zero. That's what, exactly. But, but that's why the, in the proof I need to have this last step. If I got that something else in, uh, is an optimal mechanism, then I have, have to worry, well, can I actually implement it as a market equilibrium? And so which part of the proof used the expanded set of uh, uh, mechanisms? that they, they wrote the constraint, the, rather than writing constraints for every period, I, I wrote just one big constraint. And that allowed me to, write, to solve a relaxed problem. That's basically what's happening. Yeah. Good, so now you say, okay, so when cap t is small, we know that the continuous time trading is bad. When cap t is general, but we have these conditions on distributions, continuous time trading is bad. What about if I have a general cap T and, and those monotonous conditions don't hold? Now, I don't know what's the optimal thing. I cannot solve that problem. But I can at least convince you that continuous time trading is bad. So here's what, what does better than continuous time trading. The proposition is the following. Look at those omegas parameterized by capital delta. In particular, when capital delta is zero, that's continuous time trading. The claim is... There always exists positive capital delta, which is strictly better than zero. The capital delta equal to zero. And the proof is actually the same proof that we've done for cap T being small. And let me explain to you why. When we had cap T being small, <coughs> then we said that cap T types gets revealed, everybody pay is, ge is getting paid V of C at cap T. So the, now, that's no longer true. It's no longer true that if you don't trade at time zero, your continuation payoff is V of C. But it is true for the cutoff guy. Because at capital delta, we'll start continuous time trading, and the first price will be equal to V of 
k, where k is the cutoff guy who traded at time zero. So his indifference condition is the same as if cap t was finite. And then, then the proof goes the same way, proving that twice as many people will trade at, by time capital delta, when capital delta is small, when you, have, when you close the market versus not. I like those kinds of proofs, the two-liners. <laughs> Good, finally some smiles. Good. So the last thing we try to do is to do late closure. Perfect. So what is late closure? Late closure is this setup. We trade continuously, and then before cap T, we close it for some amount of time. And I was hoping it will be two-line proof. Let's finish the paper. Let's go home. And it turns out it gets very complicated. So let me tell you why it gets much more complicated. So first observation you have is that because the market is closed here in this interval, there'll be a whole type, atom of types trading at, capital, at this time. Because there's, if you don't trade, everybody has to incur a strictly positive amount of, of cost of delay, you can get a whole atom of people trading. But that means you cannot have that in equilibrium there is continuous time trading, price going s smoothly up, and then at this moment, it jumps up. Because right before that, people would wait for the jump in prices. So actually, that creates this closure of the market, creates endogenous quiet period that nobody can trade, even though the market is open. Because everybody is waiting for this commitment moment and getting the jump in prices. So that's actually how this is an example where cap T is 10 and capital delta is 1. So the market is closed between 9 and 10. The green thing is if the market was not closed. This is, the, the, this is how the continuous time trading cutoffs are changing over time. It's sufficiently zoomed in that it looks linear even though it's nonlinear. And then what, here's what happens is that there will be a quiet period. In this example we computed, it's not all the way to, to 8, but almost all the way to 8. And actually, as a first order approximation, this if you look at the derivative, how big is this as, a, as the derivative of this? The derivative is 1. So it's kind of symmetric. And then people were following the same path up to here. Then it's constant cutoff. And then it jumps up. And then it's constant. And now comparing efficiency is really hard. Because I cannot simply say, if, I get, if this purple dot is above the green per dot, I'm done. Because the green has saved discounting on this amount of time on those guys. And it's a mess. And actually, what turns out is this first order approximation, the efficiency exactly is the same. Only the third derivatives are different. It's non if I write down the, the total surplus as a function of the length of disclosure, the first derivative is 0, the second derivative at, at 0. I'm always evaluating them at 0. So I'm asking, if I close it a little bit, the first derivative is 0, the second derivative is 0, and the third derivative becomes positive. So it's a really tiny effect. And the reason for that is that actually, as a first order appro approximation, these two dots are the same. Because, because this, thing is on the order, this thing is on the order of that, that there's like ratio is 1. And I told you in the continuous time trade, in, if I, you have a closure, twice as many people will trade as here. But I have, I have twice as much time to trade with the green, you, but here twice as many trades, so they add up at the same point. It becomes like curvature starts playing a role. So for the uniform distribution with linear, I got the, the third derivative I can, I can sign. In general, I have no idea. And I expect it can go either way. Is this a kind of, a kind of phenomenon that happens regularly in the market? Uh, I, mean, I suspect any time you have a news conference after the stock exchange closes, then you're seeing some phenomenon like this, right? Some type is being revealed. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a period during which you can't but it's happening during a period in which you can't sell, so you might as well say it's to be at the opening of the market tomorrow, mm -hmm. which means there should be a yes. backwards so, quiet period. So one example I know is that apparently there is a fact that, that when there's a time where we know that information is coming, mm -hmm. there is a quiet, the, the volume of trade drops by a lot on, on stock exchanges. And And to the point that sometimes actually the exchanges themselves even stop the trading. But you see this is a very common that before earning announcements, the, 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 the volume trades. Not always it, it drops. And some people have a different explanation. This is 
as we get close to announcements, maybe there's more people who are insider traders. If there's more inside, inside trading going on, maybe I don't want to trade because there, <laughs> there are all these insiders that are going to screw me. In this model, I know there is always this insider there. It's not that the number of insiders is changing. It's, yeah, good. So, so I computed what's the maximal gains from trade from late closure. And remember, previously I was getting things like, like one third being the ratio of efficiencies. Here, the ratio of efficiencies is of, of, of the, of, it's like, it's above 0.96. It's really tiny. And this, this is really, I was, I was really trying to find an example in which would hold. Okay, so a few other things, what else I think can be done with this model. So the first, one thing we've done is, instead of having cup T, we have the, the information, the type gets revealed at some random time, which comes via Poisson arrival rate. And I don't, I haven't replicated all the results, but for the, for the uniform linear example, uh, actually, surprisingly, the continuous time equilibrium trading looks the same, doesn't change. And, uh, and the reason for that is that for the cutoff guy, when the information comes, he gets V of C. But it's the same thing if he's going to get tomorrow if, the, if this thing doesn't come. So that's, that's really we a little bit weird, but, uh, but that's what happens. But still, you get, for in our example, restricting trade is better than having continuous time trading. I think another interesting setup kind of, yes. What do you mean by, what does restricted trade mean when? You can only trade at zero when the information comes. Okay. I know I'm cheating. <laughs> because now we have to make, we open, pen, we open the market at, at endogenously determined time. That's why I didn't present that model. I think there's an interesting question. What happens if, say, the true value is C plus epsilon? The seller knows the C, but he doesn't know the epsilon. But there will be some time in the future when the epsilon will get revealed. And then what's going to happen, and I think what's happening is there will be, be quiet time right before that. But I have to, th that's one of the designs, I think. There's a question, this model I showed you is a toy model to mostly illustrate the question you can ask in a model of dynamic trading and adverse selection. And I think there's lots of other questions to throw at it. I think that's one of them. I haven't done much, that's just, somebody after the talk said we could do this and I started playing with it. Uh, there's another thing that I don't have on this slide, slide Ben suggested. How about looking at competition between, stock, between different markets? Let's say one market is open continuously, the other one is open infrequently. Can we figure out where would people go? And what you're, you kind of can start guessing is that the low types will go to the, the restricted market, but then the, but the high types will go to the continuously, time, continuously open market. But then it's going to disrupt the other market because some of the good types will exit it, so the price will go down. But then the, the competition will start affecting things. The, the, they, if there is a new entry of a market which trades more frequently, that will reduce the volume and prices in the market which is open uh, less frequently. There's more stuff you can do. Is, you, for now, I have, have built this as a mon competition for the, uh, on the buyer side. You can say, what if there's a monopoly? Say there's, there's somebody who is a natural buyer, say Microsoft or Yahoo. <laughs> You've heard it like, save us, <laughs> save us, buy us. <laughs> I'm kidding, I, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I don't know if you want to save us. Um, <laughs> shit, it's being recorded. <laughs> 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 save us, save us. <laughs> now I have no connection to any of those decisions. So it turns out that in this world, when you take the length of the periods towards zero, the monopoly outcome converges to the competitive equilibrium that I showed you. And then the, there's kind of a funny thing that typically in a market where the, where the cost is constant, there's not independent, when there's no adverse selection, like a standard cost conjecture is there's demand and there's a monopoly with constant marginal cost and he can, the question is, what will be the efficiency of trade as a function of how, how committed he is to prices? And the cost result is, if he cannot commit to prices, we will get competitive outcomes, and those competitive outcomes in that world are efficient. In this world, in this model, competitive outcome is not efficient because of the lemons problem. And it turns out, actually, if cap T is not that large, having the monopolist being able to commit is better to him not being able to commit. That on one hand, yes, there will be the monopolist 
uh, inefficiency. But on the other hand, by being able to commit, he reduces the adverse selection, the lemons problem. And in those examples, sometimes commitment by the monopolist increases welfare. And then let me show you the last example with government interventions. So I'll change some of the assumptions. Suppose I have uniform distribution, f of c is equal to 1, but v of c is square root of c. So at 0, it's 0. Now, if I could commit to having this omega, that I can only trade at 0 or, well, actually never, so it's, this is another typo. 0 or never, then there will be people trading. Originally, I was thinking if there's no gap on bottom, I can never get trading. That's true if I have linear, if V of C is linear and they meet at the bottom. Then you can never have any trading for any omega. But if it's non-linear, like the square root, actually you can have trade if you, if you restrict trade. But if you have continuous time open market, this differential equation never starts. There are no gains from trade for the lowest type. The lowest type, remember the price is equal to the value of the lowest type. The lowest type says if I trade according to the equilibrium, I'm going to get to the price, which is the value of, of my asset if I hold it. If I delay, if there was ever trade, I'll get a higher price. Of course I want to wait. But then the, we never get trade. So then what could the government do? One thing the government could do is to say, well, we're coming in and we'll organize an auction which people can trade. We'll certify things a little bit. Say so we'll give you a little bit extra, a little bit of insurance so that, that if you try to trade a day later, we'll say, no, no, that's, you're not supposed to trade. So trying to kind of break the continuous time problem. But a different thing the government can do is to try to come to the market and buy some types on the bottom of the distribution, lose money on them, but then the market starts. So the, market, the, the government can, could internalize the, the fact that, that if we could get, create a gap at the bottom of the, of, of the distribution, then the competitive equilibrium could, could take it from there and, have, and, and generate gains from trade. So I think those kinds of questions in terms of government interventions, those are interesting as well. And I think that's kind of what people are trying to say. The TARP was trying to take some of the worst assets from the market, and then hopefully we'll get back uh, liquidity. And I think that that's a model that derives this uh, openly, uh, mathematically. And then the last thing we, we tried, to, there is a separate paper with Anya Kaori, who is, who is also at Berkeley, about this question you asked at the beginning. Are these, like, what, what if I make this a, as a game, that the buyers come and make offers? And it turns out that if offers are private, so if offers are public, nothing bad happens. We get the same stuff. But if people could come and make private offers, it's going to destroy the, those equilibria. And what's going to happen is, there, there is a proof for that, but what's going to happen is I would want to come, given this uh, equilibrium path of how the prices are changing over time, I would want to come and make you a higher offer secretly. And then there exists an offer such that it's higher than your continuation payoff for a bunch of types. And still, it's lower than the average value of those types. With public offers, that's not going to work because every, I, the whole market sees this price was offered. The seller would reject it. but says, you see, I rejected this good offer. That means I'm really good. And the prices will jump up. So the only guys who would, will accept this offer will be bad types. And verse selection is going to kill you. With private offers, this effect is not there because if you reject out of equilibrium offer, nobody sees that you rejected it. So your continuation payoff is not a function of, of, of the prices offered. Okay, so, and what we were able to do, we were able only to solve a three period game. And actually, this game with private offers has, for discount factor closing high enough, has no pure strategy equilibria, all, of, all the equilibria in mixed strategies. And we were able to prove, however, that all the mixed strategy equilibria are more efficient than the uh, pure strategy equilibrium with public offers. So that's kind of an interesting result that what's important for, m there's some pressure these days to move away transactions from opaque markets to these open, open exchanges saying, well, there's so much insider trading going on, there's all this adverse selection, people don't know what's going on, we should make things transparent. What this thing suggests is that it's okay if we make transparent transaction prices, but we should not make transparent offers and asks which are not cleared. Because people then use those to signal their types, but then the people who are making them are reluctant as a result to make them. Because they will be only accepted in, bed, in the bad states of the world. So let me sum up 
what this paper has done is I think the main point of this paper is saying in market design I think this question of timing is an important question and that's one particular model in which I can do it I think there's not enough literature on this let me give you another example to which I don't have a good answer say a hospital administrator comes to you and says we are procuring all these drugs from those drug companies how often should I run those auctions? Should I run those auctions for quarterly contracts or should I run them for annual contracts? Maybe I should run those for kind of daily contracts. You know, there is going to be some transaction cost with running those auctions, but well, we have information technology, we can, we can computerize those. We sell, we sell uh, uh, clicks in nanoseconds, so why not sell drugs in nanoseconds, right? Well, there's physical delivery, so maybe that stops us from saying nanoseconds. But that's a question that I kept on, for many years, I was, I, I, it's on the back of my mind. And yeah, I can come up with some transaction cost theory. But I think it's a good question whether there is something about mechanism design beyond simply transactions that you're trading off that there's a fixed cost to run an auction and then, but also who is the, who is the most efficient guy maybe changing over time. That's like the simplest OR answer. The question is, is there something beyond that? And, and I think for, for those kinds of things, if somebody has a startup and, and right, I think this model actually applies best to the following situation. There's an entrepreneur that starts a company and signs a contract with, with people who give him the first funding. And I think what this model would suggest is that having a contract in which there's an agreement that there will be certain milestones in the future at which we can come and discuss either making an, doing an IPO or selling the company or you buying me out and with some other money rather than coming to be, back to this continuously that this may be a useful uh, design. So, and I also think that even though this market has only one seller with only one item, I think there is a way of embedding this into a, a, a market with lots of buyers and sellers, some noise traders and so on. And actually there is a paper by Roman Spanks I had in, in the related literature, he tries to, he takes the Gloston and Milgram pay model and he asks, can I compare dark pools to continuous trading to periodic auctions? And so, so that's another paper that is currently being written asking similar questions in a different model, asking this question, what's design time? And the answer in this particular model is that if the uh, adverse selection is important then continuous trading can be improved upon. I not always know what's the best thing to do, but I know how to improve upon it. Questions? I'm very scary. <laughs> <laughs> so this, uh, in the final situation where the, the option of uh, where the, so where the, blue section, the, the dark pools versus the lit ones, is it possible to have the option where the buyer gets to make either a public or a private offer. Mm -hmm. So clearly now he's going to favor the one That's the thing. So I think as a buyer would always prefer a, a, a private offer. Uh, in this model, no matter uh, yes. what the distribution. Because, is. You are, because you as a buyer here, you are uninformed. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that the public, so you can never be worse off with a private offer. A public offer can only be be, be used against you because if it's accepted then it doesn't matter whether it was private or public but if it's rejected the only you see the, the higher you offer the if it's private that doesn't change the incentives of the of the continuation payoffs of the seller if it's public the higher you offer if he rejects it that's a, that's a good signal that he has high value so that's even if it doesn't make even if it doesn't make your selection worse at the very least, is going to reduce the probability that you will trade. So, yeah. There is a good question. If you, at the same time, so I think in some situations you can make private offers. So, but if it's a pri publicly traded company, Microsoft is not in a position. To, you cannot make really a, a private offer because it has to be approved. I think one of the ways firms get around that problem is by having these breakup fees. So what, what that, the common feature is 
I come to you and say, I'm will, I, I would be willing to make you this offer. But I'm only going to make you this offer if we agree that if it doesn't go through, you'll have to pay me some, back some money. So uh, one famous example is AT&T recently made a bid for T-Mobile. And, and uh, there was a, a, a humongous breakup fee. This was a, different, a little bit different than what I'm saying, because that, that's the breakup fee which was caused mostly because T-Mobile said, well, the government will not agree for this merger. And this will take for a long time to get resolved. And in the meantime, we'll, it's hard for us to make decisions, make investment in the company. But there are other examples in which, that's not in this model, but there's another set of problems that I come to you, make you an offer, and then you always want to start shopping for a better offer. And if you think that for me to make the offer, I have to first do some, do some due diligence and identify you as a good target, that's a public good. And I'm worried that as soon as you make you the offer, everybody, all the other VC firms see, oh, maybe <laughs> I should also make you an offer. And I think that's, that's another set of re situations where firms say, I don't want to make you an offer and leave you that you can do whatever you want to. And but when you make an offer on the house, unfortunately, that's you, we don't have that power to say, I'm making you this offer on the house, but you have to give me a breakup fee. But that often happens. Somebody makes an offer on the house, and then the agent of the, of the seller starts shopping for another offer. And that's why, actually, sometimes people make offers saying, I will pay $5,000 more than, than your highest other bid up to some number. Well... You can imagine what kinds of shopping for offers that creates. And that's why actually agents often suggest not to use those kinds of offers. And, and it's clear that immediately you should get the, you should, the agent should put in an offer for $5,000. That's max. <laughs> you know, so. Yeah, so the agent himself cannot put the offer. And the cases where I think it does work is that there are certain agents that build reputation. The agents know themselves, each other, right? So there are certain agents that build reputation over time that I'm, I'm not, it's, it's going to be a straight auction. The auction is ends, the deadline is noon, and within an hour I'll announce a winner. I don't think that's really a binding contract, but I think people do this via reputation. You do this 10 times and people start believing you. So, yes. Uh, specifying when you can open the market, can you try to tax the seller and buyers to let them trade at a particular time? Great. So, so that's something I, I, I think yesterday somebody asked me exactly the same question and it kind of opened my eyes like, wow, maybe we should think about it. So here in this, in this model, if you simply have a tax per transaction, that's going to be bad because that just reduces the gains from trade and that just makes the market less efficient. So you, in this model you would need to have, for example, a tax which is growing over time. But then you make the mechanism, mechanism designer's budget uh, increases so that relaxes that constraint a little bit? I see what you're saying. So you could use this, the money you raise to subsidize other trades, yeah. So that one I haven't thought at all about. I thought mostly about using, using the tax to stop people from continuously trading. So that's, yeah. like if you think about high frequency trading being bad in itself, you could stop the high frequency trading by taxes. That's not really in this model. Now, I can imagine either having a tax rate which is growing over time, so that you start pushing people to try it faster. So that could help in this model. I haven't done it yet. Or you could imagine, like this was a seller with a bunch of units. I think you would, what I think is, is good here is that if people, if there's a lot of trade at once. So maybe have, have a tax which is, which is, the tax rate is decreasing in the volume that you trade. If you try to trade small quantities, the tax to get, kind of have a, say, a fixed, fixed tax component so that people don't do small trades. But in the way that that paper is right now written, I don't think I can, the taxes will help here. But I agree with you that, that that's a good way of thinking. Looking at the T, can you look at the change in the discount rate? So in this model, 
what matters as a parameter is the little r times cap t. Okay. Yeah. Like, okay. that only the multiplication of those two matters. Every, how those two are split doesn't matter at all because that's just changing yeah. units of time. That's what yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, thank you.